Okay, good. All right. Wow, this is amazing. I'm amazed anyway. Um, okay, so well, it's lovely to see all of you here and lots of people I know and lots of people I don't know. And it's just fantastic, actually. Oh, I'm a bit overwhelmed. <laughs> so um, I'll just, um, I think I'll just start now. Um, people will be arriving, but um, we'll just see how it goes. So I want to um, welcome you all to our first Feminist Library webinar in our CARE series. And um, it's very important that we decided we wanted to start with care workers in crisis because um, these are people, as we know, predominantly women, very largely um, black and ethnic minorities, especially in the big cities, and they have been ignored. So um, you all, um, our audience and indeed our speakers, you're joining us in a big experiment and it's a big learning experience for all of us. I'm pretty scared, but I think we'll cope. And we hope that Zoom behaves. It didn't actually behave yesterday when um, Naomi Klein was supposed to be doing an international um, Zoom meeting. So um, yes, I'm sure that we'll all behave, but if we all get kicked out, we'll have to reschedule it. Um, some other time. Okay, so um, before we um, get down to the actually interesting things about the meeting, um, I'm just going to explain a bit to you about how things are going to work. So um, I'm Gail Chester and I'm from the, um, the management group of the Feminist Library, um, the collective, and um, there are three um, members of the collective who are going to be doing the backroom tech for us. Um, there's Magda, um, Emma and Rose and um, they've all got uh, feminist library after their names so you should be able to pick them out. Um, so um, how it's going to work is if you um, there's a chat box, um, on, there will be a, a chat box at the right hand side if you just click on the chat at the bottom um, and uh, you can type your question um, into the chat box um, and if you can mark it question at the beginning and if it's for a particular person, for Sue, for Nadia particularly, then write that in the chat box. Um, and while I'm uh, talking about all of this, it would be really lovely to, for you to introduce yourselves to everybody. Um, so you can, um, I seem to only have my participants up, oh my dear, okay. Um, there's, you should have a choice. Uh, you can either um, chat to everybody or you can chat to, uh, you can send to an individual person. So, um, have I, have other people got everybody in their chat box? You have, brilliant. Okay, well, I don't know why I haven't. But <laughs> so, we'd love to know. I can already see um, somebody I know here from Nottingham and other places as well. Um, if you could just say hello in the chat box if you feel like it, that would be great. Um, and please don't private message me because I'm so trying to deal with everything else I won't see it um, and okay and also as we go along I think some um, information will come up um, you know about actions and, and campaigns that are involved in and if you can post your links in the chat box that would be really helpful. Um, and we will save the chat box so that that will be um, available afterwards. Um, and uh, yes, also very important to, to mention at this point that we are recording this session. So um, if you um, don't want to be um, seen, we may only broadcast, um, put up on the website the audio, but feel free to 
um, turn your video off. Um, and also, um, we can pause the recording uh, if we need to at any point. Um, so don't worry about that. And if you want to speak, but you want us to pause the recording, just tell us that and um, Magda will do that. Okay, um, what else do I need to say? Okay, so we're going to take all the questions at the end um, and Emma will be collecting them up. And um, yes, okay. So, and also um, if you've got private uh, questions for the panelists, um, you should be able to um, talk to them, you could private message them. But um, what we've decided to do is we're going to end the formal part of the meeting around 8.30, but we'll keep the, um, the room open until nine. So if anybody wants to hang about and have a slightly more informal chat, then we'll, we'll do that. Um, and um, just to say that, um, we are, as you know, I know everybody says this, but we are the Feminist Library. We run, completely volunteer run, and um, we rely on donations. We, get, um, we don't really get any um, external funding. So um, if you feel able to donate to the Feminist Library, um, I think the information will be popping up um, in the chat box uh, to let you know how you can donate to the Feminist Library so that we can keep going because obviously, or maybe not obviously, we are actually um, a physical library. Um, we've just moved to Peckham um, after 30 years in Waterloo and we had only just opened um, before um, lockdown happened. Um, so we're all very devastated to be separated from our books and our physical space. And when we get back into our physical space, we will welcome you all there. Um, and we'll be holding events um, and so on, as well as using the library. So um, if you want us to keep going, please donate to us. That would be most appreciated. OK, so now. <laughs> to the business of why we're actually here. Um, so I'm going to welcome you all again. A few more people have even joined since the beginning. So um, this is about care workers in crisis, this session tonight, the first in our series um, of uh, webinars. Um, and yeah, just to mention quickly at this point as well, next Thursday we'll be having um, an overview um, from the Women's Budget Group of how the crisis is affecting all women. So, but on to the, the care workers. I feel particularly strongly about this as my family has been both carers and on the receiving end of care. And I've got good friends who are care workers as well. Um, and so we thought it would be really good to start with this and how we could take the anger with the government, which is incredibly widespread, I think, you know, including many Tories and Tory MPs, and how can we turn this into effective action? And this is what we hope that um, that we can move towards tonight because because caring is mostly done by women it's very hidden um, it's very unrecognized unrec and um, so we we do not want to just follow the media agenda we have to create our own um, and people in care homes just you know that was terribly trendy for a couple of weeks and now it's not trendy at all and now um, domiciliary care workers have hardly been mentioned throughout um, and we we feel that we can't just move on that it's our sisters our friends our parents and grandparents who need care and who are doing the caring and has the pandemic finished of course it hasn't so why should we be moving on? We don't want to leave people behind. Um, 
good. And so I think on that happy note, um, I will um, introduce um, us to the first of our speakers, um, who is Sue Himmelweit. Um, now, Sue is um, an emeritus professor of economics at the Open University and a very important part of the Women's Budget Group. Um, and she helps to formulate their policy. Um, she's worked for many years on issues to do with the economics of, pe of paid and unpaid care and care policy. So um, I'll turn over now uh, to Sue. Um, okay, so uh, can you unmute yourself, Sue, or do you need to be unmuted? I've just got a message saying I've been unmuted, but it looks as so. No, no, you're unmuted. <laughs> can you hear me? Yep, totally, yeah. yes. Yeah. And, and it seems that many other people can hear you as well, so that's good. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm going to ask you some questions, um, Sue, um, if you would like to answer them. Um, first of all, um, why do you think that social care is a feminist issue? Well, I think that at one level, they're very obvious answers, is, is that the vast majority of unpaid carers are women, and most paid care workers are women too, and also, most of those who need care are women. Um, most of those who need care is not so much about younger disabled people, but older, because women live longer, more of them need care, and, and fewer of them actually get support from their families than, um, than men do. So it's, it's at both ends, both the workers and the people who are receiving the care um, are largely women. But I would say it's, more importantly, it's a feminist issue because caring for others is something that structures women's lives. Women show by their actions far more than men do that that what ha what's happening about caring other about caring for other people is going to determine what they do. Okay, so women end up in um, worse paid jobs with worse pensions all sorts of things as a result of the fact that they stretch their lives around caring in a way that men neither do nor are expected to do. Ah, oh, good. Sorry, I was just trying to, <laughs> I was trying to open the chat box. You caught me. <laughs> okay, so, so the next question um, was, I mean, that was a, a really great answer. And um, so I'd like to know um, why, why you think the government did so badly in protecting people needing care and their carers from COVID-19? Well, the big, the big answer would be um, because they weren't focused on care. Um, and maybe that's because as a society as a whole, we're not focused on care. But more specifically, um, of course, the government was unprepared and that was an effect of austerity that during the years of austerity, it particularly cut any longer term investment and things like pandemic planning was long term investment. Um, and those things suffered particularly. Um, but given, given that it was unprepared, it then focused on the NHS. The NHS was known to be popular and it basically used the care system to help it save, as it called, the NHS. Um, and then the effects on care homes and those needing care and care workers, both in care homes and in the home, was an afterthought that came too late. And I'm not even sure that anybody has thought about unpaid carers yet. Um, mm. If instead the government had actually focused on what the NHS was for, not on the institution, but on what it was for, it would have realised that those who need care, either in care homes or their own homes, are the ones who are most likely to die from coronavirus. And it would have ensured that nobody brought coronavirus into care homes. 
and nobody could go from one home to another spreading it. It would have organized, seen that as the sort of preconditions for organizing a response to, um, to the coronavirus. Um, and you might say, well, that's impossible. How could you possibly do that? Well, they did do it in British Columbia. So in Canada, Canada has, um, is it organized in provinces? Um, and in lots of countries that have federal systems like that, you we found that the state governments have done better than the federal or national governments. And to some extent, it's true in this country, and Scotland's doing better than the rest of the UK, though it's not doing particularly well on care homes. Um, but so what did they do in British Columbia? They had a system that was a bit like ours, largely private system, um, but they effectively nationalized care, the care home system. Um, and they reorganized the, workshop, the workforce to ensure that they worked in as few settings as possible. They provided good conditions for those who were willing to move in to live in care homes. They provided good sick pay for those who suspected that they might have caught the virus. And they provided, of course, lots of PPE and testing. Well, we know what happened about that here. And they didn't send a population into care homes who might have had the virus. And the way they did this was effectively by nationalizing their care system. They made a deal, or at least the staffing side of it. So they made a deal with the unions to improve working conditions, to, to focus on ensuring that care workers didn't have to work with so many clients just to make a living. And that was absolutely vital to, to cutting its spread. So in Canada as a overall, there hasn't been the, the, the numbers, the death rates from the virus considerably better than this country. But within that, British Columbia has done a lot better than other places. Right. And um, is that because British Columbia has got a more socialist government? Or? Well, it has now. It didn't have when the care system was set up. So it has... It had a privatized system um, that, that, but the government took it in hand, realizing that that was part of the problem. Right. Okay. Um, I mean, this might be a bit beyond the scope of what we're talking about, but um, one of the things that I was wondering is there's been a lot of talk in government, um, or not in government, actually, and amongst other people about integrating the health and, and the care system in this country. Um, and I think it, it does make sense, but I, it's, it struck me a lot that there's been privatisation um, has really held that back, uh, the, the integration, because the NHS has, has so far mainly public funded um, but um, the the social care system has been systematically privatized over the last 15 20 years um, so um, I'm sure Nadia will have things to say about this as well but I just wondered if uh, you know speaking at it as it from an economic kind of point of view well I what I what I was going to say, you know, in terms of why, why ha what's been wrong with the social care system that's led to these problems is that we've, in our country, have had an obsession with saving costs. So there isn't, there's, no, there's no other industry when the main, the main policy issue that's always talked about is how can you spend less on it? You know, there, are mm. lots, there are lots of other industries where there, there has been a commitment to the quality of what goes into it. The, the, the industry is seen as a contributor to the economy or whatever, but not, not the care system. The care system is seen to be something that you get away with spending as little as possible. You're successful if you, as the, the, the phrase is always cost containment, you contain the cost. Um, and privatization has been a method of doing that. Um, so it gives the means that the government has no overall responsibility and the idea and it's been going on for a long time since the 1980s but uh, new labor was also very keen on this was the idea to give people choice 
But in fact, what the real and behind that notion of giving choice is the idea that you allow a market to work and a market that can therefore cut costs because competition among profit making firms then leads to cost cutting. And if you've got a very labor intensive industry like care, then the vast majority of, a, of the cost of care is spent on wages. There isn't a huge amount of equipment or um, other costs involved. There is rent at care homes. But the only way to cut costs then is to either reduce the time spent by care workers or their wages. And both of those lead to poor quality. And on top of that, and I think that this lies often behind the, the, the whole series of privatizations that we've had in this country, it means that you tend to get isolated, non-unionized workers. Sure. And so the, the, having a system based on profit making leads to poor quality care. And it also leads to concentration. So we're now getting big chains of care providers that are effectively property speculation companies, often based in tax havens. So, and that's an inherent tendency within a system like that, 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 that smaller care homes have a great deal of difficulty competing with larger ones. And of course, that doesn't increase choice, it reduces choice. Yeah. Where people could go. God, that's um, really shocking, the, the offshoreness of it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's, um, um so i mean shall i just go on because I'd, I'd like to say a little bit more yeah, about please, what, please do. why we've I mean, ended I mean, up in this situation with a privatized system so just just before you do i mean it seems to me that you're actually moving into the, the third question i was going to ask you about what's wrong with the social care system that led to these problems so why don't you just carry on <laughs> i will I, that's exactly what i'm doing and then i'll come back and talk about the integration issue because i think i think it's better to talk about the integration one once one knows once i've told you what i think the problems with the existing system are um so if you look at the response to the virus, here we had a privatized system. A privatized system, you're not supposed to keep running to the government to provide things that you suddenly need. So the private providers were supposed to provide their, their own PPE, their, their own protection for their own workers. But of course it was a waste just to hold stocks of that just in case. Um, so they didn't have any. The government wasn't together enough to provide it. Um, they also had a, a privatized system has every incentive to take patients wherever they come from, even if they're discharged from hospitals, and to send domiciliary care workers to as many clients as possible. Um, and in particular, in this country, there's a huge use of agency care workers um, and zero hours contracts in order that care the the employers don't even pay for all day and save money that way. Now, I don't want to say that because all care providers behave badly in the crisis, because some have behaved actually quite well and supported their residents and their workers. But this, I think this is despite, not because of the privatized system that they have to operate in. So the ones that have behaved well have, have, have um, lost a lot of money on this. Um, and may not survive, in fact, um, in the long run. Um, so to go back to that issue about integrating with the NHS, I think it's really important that the two systems work together, whether it's they're better integrated or just working together. I think it's an issue about how care is seen, that if it would always be the sort of poor relation of the NHS, in an integrated system of the health, if it would always be a poor relation of the health service in an integrated system, then it might be better separate. But either way, we need it to be more like the NHS. We need, we need, we've always been calling for a national care, care service, you know, a bit like the National Health Service. I think Labour has taken this up now too. Um, but I think the really important thing is if you get them to, if you get the two systems to work together, 
make the care system more like the NHS. Don't make the NHS more like the care system, which mm. was, which is is actually the direction of movement that's been happening in the NHS. Right. Okay. Thank you. Well, um, yes, I think that's that's really a really useful introduction and, and overview um, from Sue. Um, maybe we could all just put our hands and wave in the air or something instead of clapping. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, if I could just um, remind you that um, if you want to put your questions in the chat box and mark it question, um, that would be really welcome. Um, I think Sue's brought up some really interesting points that you might like to comment on. Um, and also, if I could just remind you um, that you can um, donate, um, and we would really love it if you could donate to the Feminist Library, um, and the details of that should be appearing in your chat box at some point. Um, okay. Oh, there it goes. Well done. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's move on now to, to Nadia Whittam. Um, we're really, really pleased that she was able to um, be here this evening, especially in the middle of all the sturm and drang that's going on in Parliament. Um, Nadia's been the Labour MP for Nottingham East since the December 19 elections and most importantly in this context she's been a care worker and she's still campaigning or she's gone back to campaigning hard for care workers so um, welcome okay. Nadia. Well, hi everyone thanks. thanks for having me I'm really really glad to be here and Hello, especially to people who are here from Nottingham. I think there are a few people from the Women's Centre, which is in my constituency and great campaigners. Lovely. Oh, that's fantastic. OK, so, so could you tell us a bit about how you got into campaigning around care? Why? So for me, it was because of my own background, because of my friends and colleagues, um, who were care workers. I was a care worker from when I was about 19 until I was about 21. I've been in a trade union since I was about 16. And I returned to the front line of care work during COVID because I knew what the existing pressures were on care workers, predominantly women, all low paid, disproportionately migrants or women of colour. And I wanted to offer my practical solidarity. And what I saw was, was what was expected and what any care worker will tell you, which is that care workers are already underpaid, overworked, undervalued. And then on top of all of that, having had around 7 billion cut from social care since 2010, on top of the crisis that was already going on in social care, they had to then bear the brunt of coronavirus. So all of the, the legwork is of course carried by these frontline low paid workers. And also the burden of coronavirus was moving from hospitals into care homes. So it was, it was even more intensified. I think what really, what I found very striking having gone from working as a care worker and then after that I was a hate crime worker and then I was elected and then returning to be a care worker was being around the pomp and the privilege of Westminster and hearing, hearing the way that some of the, the Tories opposite me would speak about people like me, like my former colleagues, as being low skilled just because we were low paid. And then seeing the hypocrisy of a government that would clap for care workers and for our key workers on a Thursday, whilst voting away their rights in the immigration bill on the Monday, mm -hmm. and 
generally just not equipping them with adequate PPE, um, with adequate financial protection um, or adequate testing. It was, it just, it was extremely stark. Um, and by then, of course, it was too late. So many care homes and care workers and residents were already infected and we were and are looking at the worst death toll in Europe. Um, of course, you'll, you'll know about, because it, it hit the, um, the front pages, what happened with my experience in care work when, when I returned. Um, but really the story there isn't that I was effectively sacked, which is what happened. The story is that this happens to care workers and low paid workers all over the country. People who don't have the privilege that I have now as an MP, the, the platform that that brings, the financial security that it brings, and who can be sacked at the drop of a hat if they're on a zero hours contract, not go through any kind of due process, particularly in a sector that is what's well, not just low paid and the conditions aren't just poor, but connected to that, the trade union density is very, very low. And that goes, um, goes back to what Susan was saying about it being a fragmented workforce. Um, yeah, that's probably, I know that you've got other questions, so other things <laughs> that, I, that can probably fit into that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was I was going to ask you, um, you haven't actually mentioned yet that you've asked um, people, uh, care workers, to send their experiences in to you, uh, presumably to help with, with your campaigning. And uh, have you had much of a response to this? Yes, I've, my inbox was inundated with testimonies from care workers and also residents of care homes and retirement villages with similar experiences and that was what we've always known because we'd seen until then um we'd seen before then care workers and healthcare workers being gagged um we know that care workers um are chronically underpaid that's sort of not a well-kept secret um and the evidence that we got, of course, I can't, I can't go into it too much because it's, it's confidential in nature. Um, and the workers who have, who've given that evidence are precarious by, by the nature of the work that they do. But my experience was by no means an isolated experience. I knew that when it happened. And when I was elected, I always said that my, my main job as an MP is to be here to amplify the voices of other people who are marginalised and to pass the mic and to open up Parliament to campaigners and activists and rank and file workers. And I think that's extremely important. So I'm, I'm looking forward to us embarking on that campaign together so that we can hopefully improve rights and conditions and security in the whole of the care sector for all workers. Great, that's fantastic. Um, and um, so could you say a bit more, um, it's your pinned tweet, but um, it would be helpful if you could just say a bit more about what you mean when you say, we need a new deal for social care. Um, what are the things that you particularly think we should be campaigning about? Um. I'd echo so much of what Susan said. The failures in the social care sector have been systemic and that's got absolutely nothing to do with the workers in it. It's because of the way that the sector has been fragmented um, and privatised. And that fragmented, privatised model has been shown not to work. It wasn't working before COVID. Um, it's certainly not working now. And in fact, I'd argue that that model is part of the reason why the disease, why um, the virus spread so rapidly through care homes. Because where you have 
different private providers competing for PPE, all implementing different policies and almost all paying their staff poverty pay. Not just poverty pay, but also in the most precarious circumstances um, so that they're afraid to speak out. All of that just comes together to be a recipe for disaster. Um, what I'd say about, about social care to begin with and other, other care workers um, will, will know this and have, have already spoken about this um, in other places. But when you've got, it's, it's as Susan said, when um, funding cuts are made or savings as they call them, are made. Those are always at the expense of either workers' wages or um, quality of care, time of care, which then becomes quality of care, or both. So what you end up with having is low-paid workers going not just one extra mile, but several extra miles, just to provide the standard of care that people need. Because just because all of these cuts have been made, people's social care needs don't disappear. Someone has to do it. And I don't know a single care worker who would leave someone's house before, before that's done. Um, and all of that burden falls on, falls on workers. Um, the other things that I'd say about, about the article that I wrote, um, and about what a new deal for social care should look like. What we have at the moment is lots of different private companies. And if, if you look at the websites of these companies, you could be forgiven for thinking that they were on a mission of pure altruism, but they're not, they're, they're private providers, their workers do very, very good jobs, but many of them as companies make big profits at the expense of their workers. And the government funding that they get um, is being siphoned off and going into, into private pockets. And that's why I say that we need a wholesale reform of the sector and a national care service, as was promised in the last Labour manifesto. And that's on top of a rise in pay, in status for care workers and in conditions. But one of the things that I'd like to speak about because I think this is important is when we talk about public ownership that that doesn't have to mean and shouldn't mean in my opinion a centralized service that doesn't take into account people's people's needs and um, local democratic accountability the way I see it is both socialism and social care are about maximizing autonomy and maximizing power and it's not about labeling people as vulnerable because i don't think anyone anyone likes to be labeled as a vulnerable person the fact is that people are marginalized by conditions in society and what social care should do and what socialism should do a socialist labor government is give people power and to make sure that they can hold on to it. And in social care, that looks like um, democratic public ownership so that local people have a say in the way that services are run, so that service users do, and so that workers do. Right, fantastic. Well, I, I so completely agree with you. And actually, um, Magda just, uh, pressed her reactions button and you can um, either clap, um, I'm clapping now, uh, put your thumbs up. So I'm sure that, um, yes, I should have thought of that earlier, but you're very welcome to, um, to press your reactions button at any point. <laughs> I'm a big um, fan of the reactions buttons on Zoom. I think yes. I use them. I think I think we should. I mean, not for you, you understand, but I think we should have a third one, which is that was a load of rubbish. You know? <laughs> really don't I, like what somebody's saying. Thanks for the clarification, Gail. 
<laughs> okay. Well, um, what I um, I, I'm just thank you very much anyway for that. That was really great. Um, so again, just to mention about putting your questions in the chat box and donating to the Feminist Library, uh, we need your cash. And if you do, you'll be able to participate in lots of more exciting events like this, both on and hopefully offline in the not too distant future. Um, I'd just like to um, mention that um, we were looking forward to welcoming um, Carolina Gerlich onto our panel, um, but unfortunately um, she had a family emergency, so she wasn't able to be with us. Um, now, she's the director of the Care Workers Charity. Um, I hope we've got a link for her that we can put up at some point. Um, and, um, I was, when I first heard of, of her or of the organization, I was a bit worried that care workers' charity just didn't sound very campaigny. But in fact, um, she's joined recently as the director of the CWC and she is focusing um, very much on campaigning. Um, and migrant workers are a particular concern of hers. Um, but also they do give out grants, um, she wanted me to mention this, um, of up to, um, up to £500 um, for care workers who are in crisis. Um, I don't actually know how much money they've got at the moment given you know, the dire situation that everybody's in, but um, certainly it would be worth finding out a bit more about about CWC and I hope we can have her um, on a, a panel um, sometime in the future. Um, the, the other thing um, I'm just going to do now is, you know, this relates very much to what um, Nadia was saying um, about, um, you know, people's working lives being precarious and um, that obviously people cannot come cannot step forward themselves um, because uh, of their fears of being sacked and victimized um, but um, we we at the feminist library we were very um, lucky we're actually um, producing um, a zine on the, the topic of, of care um, which should be out any time soon and again we'll post information about that when it becomes available um, but um, in in anticipation of this um, we we interviewed um, a woman called Mary who is a domiciliary care worker um, who works for a local authority um, and I'm going to read you some of what she says because she can't be here to be a speaker herself. So first of all, she um, describes a bit about her job. Um, as a domiciliary care worker, I visit clients in their homes and attend to all their personal and practical needs. This can cover providing their food, giving them medication, washing and bathing them, doing shopping, so many things. Some clients may need four visits a day, like most other domiciliary care workers, I work from morning to night on split shifts. For example, I might work 7 to 10 a.m., then 12 to 3, then again from 5 to 9.30. I don't live in the area where I work and I have to get the bus up and down to reach my job. So... Um, we asked her if she could tell us a bit about the difficulties that domiciliary care workers face, particularly during this period of COVID-19. So Mary says, I wanted to talk to you because I want to bring attention to domiciliary care workers. The government and media don't give us any attention even now. At first, the clapping was only for frontline workers in the NHS, and of course, they do a very good job, but we need to be recognized as part of the healthcare system. 
When the situation in care homes began to be revealed, they changed the Thursday night clapping to clapping for carers, but I didn't hear anything about domiciliary care workers. And focus on PPE is still seems to be pretty much on care homes. Um, by the way, I mean, I have very deeply ambivalent feelings about whether the Thursday night clapping is going to continue. Um, this might be a, a thing that people would like to ask questions about or make a comment about. So Mary goes on, I live with my elderly mother and my teenage daughter, so I'm very worried about going into my clients' homes and then carrying coronavirus to my home. And also the possibility of carrying coronavirus from one of my clients to the others. Domiciliary care workers who come through agencies aren't given PPE at for local authority, are only given one set to last the whole week. We should be given a complete set for each job. Domiciliary care workers don't have an office. We walk or take public transport from one job to the next. Not many of us have cars. Before COVID-19, if you lived too far away to get home between shifts, and most of us do, then you could sit in a cafe or go to a library, but they're all closed now. So now we have to hang about in the streets, sheltering where we can. I thought this was one of the most upsetting bits, actually. We can get ill from going on public transport the whole time. We can get colds from being out in the rain. We have no time to rest. So that in itself is bad for our health. If we're not taken care of, there will be a complete breakdown in the system. There's already a great pressure if staff are off sick. So then she talks a bit about the split shifts and how the local authority introduced split shifts last year to save money. Um, I won't read that all to you, but it, she goes on saying that since they changed the contract, you're, only, you're not paid for the hours you're hanging around, but you're still under the pressure of your job because you can't do anything while you're waiting. It's very worrying and distressing for those of us who don't live locally. Domiciliary workers are lone workers. We shouldn't have to hang about in the streets without any support. In some ways, private agency care workers have more choice. For example, they can refuse to do the evening shift. Whereas if you work for the council, they force you into doing shifts, even if it's very, a very unsatisfactory split shift system. So as a council worker, you are paying for the fact that you have job security and a pension when the whole system is very unfair. So then I asked her whether she experienced extra pressure because of being black. Most workers in the care system are black, she replied, especially in London and the bigger cities. And we definitely have more pressures on us. For example, my GP wrote a letter to the council because of my diabetes to say that my shifts should be arranged so that I could eat proper meals, but he was ignored. There is a white girl on my team who is diabetic and they let her stay in the office. I should say that this happened before COVID-19. I happen to know this. Um, and, um, and they've since then, they've been ignoring the diabetes, although we hear, you know, there's been a lot of coverage in the media last week and so on about how diabetic people are more vulnerable to um, coronavirus. Um, I also suffer from incontinence, so my GP said I should have visits near each other. He told management that they should try to accommodate me, but they didn't. The strain of all this is making me lose my confidence as I worry this could happen to me while I'm out. My male manager told me I had no right to use clients' toilets when I'm in their house. Where is the duty of care to me? Black women don't seem to have any access to being heard. They don't respect us. And even when we have qualifications, we are not given the chance to be promoted. So, yeah, that's that was Mary's testimony. 
um, and it seemed to me that it's pretty shocking. Um, and uh, like she says, you know, domiciliary care workers are, I think, now slowly being, um, you know, given some visibility, but in my opinion, not enough. Okay, so now, um, Emma, ah, oh, this, yes, I was just about to ask you, oh no, that was me to you. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping now that we've got lots of questions. Um, so, uh, and which Emma was supposed to be sending through to me. Um, right. Perhaps you could all just have a little shake or a little smile or turn to the person next to you on the screen and wave to them or something while I wait to see. Oh, here we are. Okay. Yes. Um, okay. So, yeah, I think these are good questions. I've got some good questions here. Um, all right. So, the first um, question I'd like to ask comes from Penelope. Um, and um, Penelope, um, would you like to ask this question yourself or would you like me to ask it for you? Um, you'll have to unmute yourself because there's such a lot of people on the screen. Um, yeah, okay. Would you Hi. like to? Yeah, okay. Would you like to do that? What was the question that I oh. asked? <laughs> you, you said... Um, no one is talking about unpaid carers yet. No, I mean, this is the thing that's really interesting to me. As um, an unpaid carer, I feel like we've, we've talked quite a bit about paid carers in care settings, not domiciliary, domiciliary care, which, I, which your you know, last contributor was talking about. We haven't been talking about that enough. But we have been talking about care homes a bit and the impact, but we haven't talked at all about the impact on unpaid carers. Um, that I've been seeing. I've written a few things myself the last week, but um, but I'm not seeing it anywhere. And I'm really curious, is anyone else seeing it talked about anywhere at all? So, thank you. That's a great question. Okay, Sue or Nadia, which of you would like to? Nadia, please. Um, Penelope, thanks for that. I can feed that back to, uh, to the Shadow Health team, which, which I'm a part of now in the PPS. Um, I think you're absolutely right about unpaid carers. This, this unpaid, very physical and emotional labour invariably falls on women. Um, from my kind of background, um, I'm Indian, and it's, it's very usual for women in the family to have to care for their their parents or their in-laws um, and that unpaid labour is just expected and of course during Covid that throws up all sorts of other struggles for you around the financial protection that's available for you um, around PPE and that's the same for um, domiciliary care workers because of course if you're if you don't have an employer or if your employer is um, somebody on direct payments then you're not always going to be able to to get PPE and if you're an unpaid carer you just don't get it at all um but I'd be interested to hear a bit more from you about your experience um so that I can feed that back um Penelope can you unmute yourself there you are you're still muted oh no. I'm gonna there just she is. as well um my my autistic son is here and he's very um, really noisy. So I'm usually Paddington. What would you like? Paddington. Okay, I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, so I'll do this while I'm I'm talking to you. So um, I I I've seen the research that that Carers UK have done, which is coming out next week um, for um, for Carers Week. I think they've they've seen it. I think seventy percent of their carers have seen an increase in their care responsibilities during this time, and over half of unpaid carers are worried about burnout. Like seriously, seriously worried about burnout. I think we haven't even begun to see the consequences of this. I mean, for instance, I mean, I've my I've lost about fifteen hours a week of respite at the moment. Um, luckily, not more because I'm 
you know, very fortunately for me, my son's school has been amazing and has continued to um, have him at school. But, you know, that that's, I know people who have lost every single bit of support they've, they've ever had, everything overnight went. Um, and I just, I don't, I think the consequences are going to be huge for this. And we're not talking about it. I mean, we're not really, we weren't really talking about unpaid care before anyway. But now I feel like the impact is, is going to be, you know, phenomenal. I think you're absolutely right. And well, of course you're right. It's your lived experience. But I think as well, someone, the, a group of people who are often missed out are um, children or adults as well with learning disabilities um, or mental health that means that they need to be cared for. Um, people often think of social care and think that it's it's all elderly people, but it's that's not the case. I, Sue, yeah. I listened to a um, woman's hour this morning on the on the radio, um, and they had some people talking about unpaid care, paid unpaid care situations, and the, the the what they they were often talking about the exhaustion of of you know that everything becomes more complicated. All the all the so even somebody was was willingly taking on an unpaid care responsibility before it suddenly becomes much more much more complicated and much more more difficult. In um, and of course a lot of the carers themselves are in groups that they need to, that need to be very careful themselves about their own health. Um, and I suspect that all this has got over the past few years has got very much worse. I mean, an, an unpaid carer is supposed to have their own assessment. There is, their needs are supposed to be assessed. Um, and I can't imagine that that's happening at the moment. Um, okay, could I'd actually like to um, speak as a an unpaid carer in fact um, I unfortunately um, I come from into this situation of caring from every possible angle um, and uh, I'm I'm a carer for three different adults um, as well as being a person who's um, got long-standing chronic illnesses um, and uh, my sister um, is currently living in sheltered accommodation um, and um, I uh, right back at the beginning of this whole crisis I it was absolutely clear to me that um, she that, that her workers were not getting the protection that they needed in their sheltered accommodation um, and um, I fell ill right at the beginning of, of the crisis. My sister was in hospital. She came out of hospital almost as soon as she came out of hospital. Um, I fell ill uh, with a quite severe virus. I don't think it was COVID-19. It might have been. But anyway, I was ill for several weeks. And it was unbelievably difficult to try and, you know, the, the carers in her home were doing their total best uh, with my sister and with the other um, staff, uh, the other residents. Um, but I was, I was in this situation, which I'm sure many people have been in um, during uh, this crisis, where they're ill, they're trying to look after other people who need care, and, um, and the care workers are, it's just like, Un, you know, we we all feel, I think, justifiably neglected. So yes, thank you very much for that um, comment. Um, okay, um, I think I'll take the next question here um, from Bridget. Um, do you want to ask the question yourself, Bridget, or would you like me to ask it? Oh, you've got to unmute yourself. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. Can I ask it? Yes, um, it, by all means. Yes. Um, I was involved uh, three years ago um, through Warwick University with the Women's Budget Group report on towards a new deal for care. 
and carers. Um, the series smiling. Do you, do you remember that? <laughs> um, however, I I am a community activist, and it I noted from something that Nadia said about autonomy, and in some ways, autonomy is not the full picture we have to find ways of working together so my question is in terms of central government should that be cross-party we have to find ways of bringing the different parts of government and services together and to get round the table together not as um, disparate separate organizations all right, so you were originally asking about whether you thought this should be or whether the panelists thought this should be cross-party working on this area. Um, yeah. So that, yes, would either of you like to comment on that? So you're still muted, Nadia. Shall I unmute you? No, you don't want to say anything. You've given up. Oh, no. I, I, was, I was trying to mouth that I can't unmute myself. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Um, so go ahead, Nadia. Thanks, Bridget. Um, what I meant by autonomy was about individual autonomy to have power over, over their own lives. Um, and also doing that collectively. Um, and as a community, and I don't think the two are in conflict. I think um, I think there can and should be space for individuals to have power and autonomy um, within, you know, a sort of caring community collective setup. Um, yes, I think that it should be cross-party, and of course, if we're going to achieve anything in the next five years, it will be mainly outside parliament um, and also some sort of tentative wins inside parliament too. Um, I'm, I'm not sure um, what the appetite from the Tories is, is on this. I mean, they've been responsible for cutting funding from social care by about 7.7 .7 billion in the last decade and even now that we're in the midst of this terrible crisis, social care isn't getting the, the funding or potential recognition that it needs and deserves. Um, but it's certainly something that I'll keep pushing for. And I think that there are some Tories who, who would agree as well, but perhaps they feel that it's a bit early in the current parliament to be rebelling or making a fuss. So I hope that I hope that they kick themselves into action soon. Well, maybe this crisis will encourage them. <laughs> um, Sue? Um, there are two parts to your question. Um, I, I'll talk about the cross-party one. For, we, there was an attempt, a very good attempt, in 2009 to find a, a cross-party solution. Um, in, sort of in the last years of the um, Labour government there, and I don't know if you remember, but the the Tories blew it basically by talking about death taxes. There was they were they were there was an attempt to have an agreement, and a which would have been a version of everybody pays into a a national insurance fund um, when you reach the age of sixty five or some or some particular age. Um, or after you die, if you if you don't have the money there, or the state does it for you if you never have the money, um, and then everybody gets free personal care. Um, and there was things were going fairly well um, on that, but the Conservatives decided that in order to have freedom, people ought to be able to decide if they want to join the national system. Now, insurance systems don't work if you allow a social insurance system isn't a social insurance system if you allow everybody to choose whether they join it or not because those people who need most who will need, need to get most out of it will be keen to join and then the, 
the price will, you know, the amount paid per person will go down because all those who don't have great needs um, uh, move out of it. So what one needs is a system for pulling risks for the whole, the whole of society to say, these are things that can happen to anybody, um, or even if it can't, we want to look after those people it, who it does happen to. Um, let's have a system for pooling risk so people pay according to their ability to pay and they, um, and they get out according to their needs. Um, and that's basically what a free, a free system tax funded would be. And one could talk about, you know, the particular ways of, tax, of funding it by taxing, but that would be um, what would be in sort of embodiment of, of that sort of principle. And I don't think you would get anybody saying, oh, well, that's not a fair thing to do. But they would have huge debates about what the, the fairest form of that is. And always behind there has always been this idea of how can we spend as little as possible on it. Um, and so I think the chances of cross-party um, agreement is actually very small. I think it's, exa it's exactly what you need. Um, because this is a system that has to last. It has to last through, through different governments. And it's, it's certainly the right thing to try. But with the current sort of government, I'm not at all confident about it. Let me talk about autonomy too, because autonomy is, is a word that's used um, to justify the current system too. The idea that, you know, everybody should be able to make their own choices about everything. You can choose which care home you can go to. You can choose who you employ. You can even get your own budget to employ your, your carers yourself. And I think that's an incredibly narrow notion of autonomy. That what one really wants is people to be able to, that the people with disabilities or for whatever reason they need care, to have as much real choice in their life as possible. So that, and when you talk about, um, about that, you mean choice over how you're helped, the things you're helped to do, and so on. So, it should be choice with care, not choice without care. Um, the, the government talks a lot about things like enabling people to lead independent lives. Well, if you, if you mean an all-encompassing notion of independence that might mean independence with care, that's fine. But if you just mean trying to, to get people to be able to survive by themselves without us, the state, having to put any money into them, that's an incredibly narrow notion of autonomy and not one that's that I would want to go for but an, a real notion of autonomy would deliver care to all sorts of people who have the hope of getting it at the moment because it would have a much more a notion that you need care for much more than just simple physical things then in the moment for example if you're lucky enough to get it you get the care to get you know, somebody will come and help you get out of bed. They don't come and help you do anything when you've, you've got out of bed. Mm -hmm. And a broader notion of what care do, that would also mean setting up the care work as a real profession, a profession that with good proper training, a career structure, a good, good pay, and so on. So I think you, focusing on the word autonomy is really important. It's, it's really what it has to be. And, and I really liked what Nadia said about, you know, that that's also important politically. Um, that people, that, that as a society, we are involved in planning what a good care system would be like. And the people individually have a say about the sort of care that, that they get. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I've got um, what I think is leads on very nicely from that um, and um, is another question, which is something that we wanted to turn our attention to, um, which has come from Leah. Um, 
I don't know whether Leah is in the house and would like to, ah, there you are. Would you like to ask the question yourself? Just nod and I'll unmute you. Oh God, you've Sorry. jumped about. <laughs> That's not your fault. <laughs> it's the way the system works. Yeah, okay, go ahead, Leah. Uh, yeah, my question was about um, how, given the difficulties that we've been talking about in terms of unionizing, the kind of offshore nature of um, ownership of care homes and the great number of unpaid care workers who are often working in their own homes. How do we move towards a place of collective action and campaigning? What, what strategies might exist for bringing carers and people who are recipients of care together to advocate for um, a new deal? Um, and I also had a kind of second um, thought, which was about, you know, we were talking about clap for carers and this kind of huge demonstrative gesture towards care and NHS workers that didn't have any kind of um, political or material impact behind it. And do you feel that there's a, some way of harnessing that kind of display of gratitude that we've seen? to making material change now that it's perhaps more in the public eye. Thank you. Which of you two would like to say something about that first? <laughs> Go on. <laughs> Don't all rush at once. <laughs> mine's, mine's just a um, fairly brief answer. Or it, it was going to be when I started it, it might, it might expand a less brief answer. Um, but I think the most important thing is for care workers, all kinds of care workers, including unpaid workers, to unionise. Um, and I, I think for being an unpaid carer with the traditional unions, that's a little bit more difficult, although you can, you can join them. But certainly with unions like the IWGB, that are trying to establish a, a care workers branch at the moment um, and they're doing excellent work on the wider campaigning as is the GMB actually which is my union and they're, they're also very good workplace reps. I think one of the biggest problems in, in social care is that the workforce isn't unionised and that makes us so much easier to exploit. Um, so I, I think that has to be the start. Right. And connecting with community unions as well, like yeah. everyone, um, because all of those things are, are interlinked. Uh, Sue, do you want to say anything? I'm not really involved in in organising or anything like that, and um, Nadia knows much more about it than I do. One of the things that we're doing in the Women's Budget Group, though, is arguing for a care-led recovery so after you know after we all go back to work lots of people are going to have lost their jobs and so the government will have to continue spending money or hopefully it will continue spending money um in order to boost the economy and get get um get it going again and people with an in people to have an income and the normal way you tend to do that is spending on big construction projects or something like that and what we're saying is, well, don't, don't do that. Let's spend it on having a proper care system. And we've actually done some analysis that shows that you get twice as many jobs per pound that you spend on care than you, than you get for spending on construction. When you, when you think about all the ramifications of that spending, that not only the, you know, the workers who are directly employed, but the workers indirectly employed flying the industry, and then how the wages are then spent and that's there will have to be some sort of recovery program so we're trying to argue for a care-led recovery mm. um yeah i think i think the point that that nadia makes um about unionization is is important um although i do know that um mary and some people i know who work as carers elsewhere have had quite a struggle um, encouraging their colleagues to join the union um, 
but I think actually this latest crisis may have uh, served to radicalise um, people towards joining a union. Um, I'm just going to read out a comment. Um, okay, I'm, yes, it's come up a bit funny in my uh, chat box. Um, but Irena, um, who is um, a, a stalwart of the older feminist network, um, she asks, what do you think about the work of the National Pensioners Convention? And um, I think that that actually, um, you know, raises for me also, you know, that it, um, it has to be, I think, sorry, I know that I'm not supposed to be, I'm supposed to be facilitating this. Anyway, <laughs> I think what we need is we need to, to work across community and workers because many people fall into both of those categories, don't they? So, um, and pensioners are, you know, I, I'm not personally very clear about what the National Pensioners Convention is. I'm sorry, I'm a pensioner. Um, but uh, yeah, okay. So, could you do you have any comments on that point? Um, I'm afraid I don't know what the National Pensioners Convention has said about care. I know what they said about pensions. Might. Um, I'm afraid I don't either. Um, if you could share the link, that would be really helpful because I'd be yeah. Keen to I, I imagine knowing Irena, it's a fairly radical organisation. I mean, the point it brings to me is that there are very many different sectors in the community where, um, you know, who could, who will come into alliance. And actually, I'm, I'm a member of an organisation I can recommend to any older people here, which is called Silver Voices. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but it's a marvellous campaigning organisation on behalf of, of older people. Um, and they couldn't uh, participate today either, but I think we might try and get them along for a, a later webinar. Um, okay, um, so I'm just having a quick look down. Um, okay, so Sue asks, uh, with the house price slump that is coming, what effect do we think that will have on people's attitudes? Is a house price slump coming? Well, I don't know. You're the um, <laughs> economics expert. <laughs> it's not, I don't know. I mean, the housing market is so peculiar. Um, I think that... The, this is to go back to the previous question. The issue about house prices and care is a peculiarly British one. I don't think any any other country would think about that the major the major the one sticking point you might say about any solution to social care is about housing. Is about whether people have to sell their houses or not. I think mm. the, the Boris Johnson said, oh, we need a cross-party solution, but the one thing I won't have is that people need to sell our houses. That's not a policy about care. That's a policy about houses, and not even houses as housing, but houses as, as a speculative investment good. Um, so I don't know. I mean, people are very attached to their houses in this country. And see their future very much bound up with you know how much money how much money that okay so just to widen that question out a little bit somebody else has asked a question um what factors do you think could trigger changes in our societal perceptions of care and women carers now, there's a one to conjure with I think there's an issue about whether that's actually happened. I mean, it, there may have been a change. Um, if there has, we need to keep it going. We need to keep that awareness aware. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's, it has particularly stressed the, the gender aspect of it. 
Okay, so, so what we're talking about is a strong and firm feminist movement that is taking on all these issues as well as everything else. Yes, Nadia, please. Sorry, my, my internet's cutting out, so I didn't hear the last sort of 30 seconds. Ah, uh, of, of what Sue said. Yes, and of what you said. Okay, I said we need feminist revolution now, in essence, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I think Sue was probably edging in that direction, but she was being a bit more general. Would you like to repeat? All I said was that I think we're talking about a change that might make care workers more valued. Maybe we've had that, maybe not. Um, it hasn't particularly stressed the, I mean, the, the commentary we've had recently hasn't been particularly about the gender aspect of it. But of course, any, any improvement in the way care workers are seen that, that actually translates into anything real will be a fantastic, fantastic boost for women. Mm -hmm. Okay, Nadia, now, can you hear now? Um, it's, it's going in and out and I didn't hear the question. Okay. Um, Sorry. Huh. No, 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 that's fine. Um, well, the, the question, um, the, the question was, this is going back a bit, that what factors could trigger changes in our societal perceptions of care and women carers? Okay. Did you manage to catch I, that? Yeah, yeah, I did. I mean, I think that coronavirus could be a real turning point. It's certainly, um, I'm so sick of hearing this, but it's, it's <laughs> shone a light on the, um, on the inequalities in society and also, you know, in, in how those are, are functioning and playing out and how the care sector is so overstretched and underpaid and undervalued, um, or care workers are. Um, I think that a lot of people feel oversaturated with with things to to care about, and the the government um, the government technique and mo seems to be to sort of overload people with bad things, so that we just become numb to it and switch off, and or that we develop this sort of toxic positivity that oh everything will be okay it will be fine because we'll we'll get through it um when i think we do have to be hopeful because we don't have any choice but to be hopeful things have to change but that doesn't mean glossing over all the bad things it means confronting them and changing them together mm, okay thank you um sophie made a comment here which says i think we need more of a public profile so people can learn about the work and see the profession as valued um yes um i completely nadia agrees i agree penelope agrees um i think the question though i mean seriously um is about about movement. I mean, I think we do have to talk about the fact, which is where we started, that the majority of women, uh, the majority of workers, word, are women. The majority of unpaid carers are women. Probably, although not definitely, the majority of cared for people are women um, and you know society expects us as women to behave ourselves and know our place and just get on with things without complaining um, and and I feel personally that we need to introduce a more um, I don't know, a more, more material analysis into the feminist movement. I mean, it's fantastic that the feminist movement has revived itself in the last few years, but um, I think until the current crisis, 
maybe you know maybe it would be more of a wake up call to feminists uh, let us hope so um, than uh, you know to some other, well, I won't say to some other set feminists coming on board with agitating around these issues. I think that is very important. Um, yeah, okay. All right, so, oh, it's 8.27. That's, um, <laughs> thank you for that clap, Rose. <laughs> <laughs> I, I told her beforehand that she was to clap me, you know. <laughs> I didn't really, honest. Um, okay, so um, I think if nobody else has got any pressing formal questions, um, I will just, I'll give you a few closing remarks. There's a question from Claire, sorry Gail. Oh, I didn't see it, sorry. No. Oh, sorry, it's, it's sent privately to me, sorry. I'll okay. That's fine. Well, why don't you go ahead with that then? Okay. Yeah, so it should have gone out uh, to everyone now. Uh, Claire, do you want to say something about it? Do you want to ask it yourself? I've unmuted you. Um, it was um, the words you used about toxic positivity and um, um, accepting a situation and it got me thinking and I wanted to hear a little bit more about um, that term and kind of where um, where you how you see that having developed and what things you think will help that change I think I think it's become a sort of a condition under capitalism um, that because capitalism doesn't benefit the vast majority of us instead we're told you know just to stay positive the reason why our lives aren't good is because we're not positive enough and this is happening in workplaces particularly during coronavirus that lots of workers are being told you know stop complaining don't don't be negative we, coronavirus doesn't need your negative energy you just need to stay positive um, and work hard and everything will be all right. When actually positivity isn't going to save lives, positivity isn't going to put food on the table for people or pay people's rents. And I'm not saying that we should go around moping, but the situation is dire. And, you know, particularly for the most marginalised people. And as a society, I think we need to recognise that and vow to change it rather than putting a positive gloss on things which you know as human beings we're all going to have to do to some degree during parts of our lives just to just to get through it and particularly now there's there's nothing wrong with trying to look at the bright side but as a society i think that's very toxic right okay uh, claire does that um answer your question So you, yes, it does. Jolly good. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, you're on my screen, so I can see you down there. Um, okay. Um, yes, it's more of Cameron's big society, isn't it? Says Magda. Work more for free, and everyone will be happier. Be kind is another way to silence women. Yes. Although, hmm, I, I mean, I do agree. But at the same time, I feel like, I don't know, it's like if I get too depressed, then I become immobilized. So I think what we're looking for here is a kind of, you know, balance between, you know, false positivity and actually thinking, you know, that there is some possibility for, for fighting back, really. I try to balance myself between hope and rage, and I find that that's, <laughs> that's a nice cocktail. Yes. <laughs> hope and rage. I, I think one of the things that has come out of this is, and one of the reasons I think that care is so disregarded is because women do it for nothing, and therefore 
people think that it shouldn't really cost anything. So that, you know, that, that all that notion of, you know, we need to get a social care system as cheaply as possible is all based on the idea that actually women ought to be doing it for nothing anyway. And I think that one of the positive things that's come out of this is, that, first of all, a lot, a lot more people have been involved in caring than they used to, particularly for children. But this might also, um, this might also be true of older people, of, of adult care too. I don't know if that's true, but certainly for children. And far more people have realised that actually it takes time and energy. It's not just a, an attitude of mind. So being, you know, being caring or being kind is something that actually does take time and prevents you doing other things. Um, and that seems to me is one a really important feminist insight. It's not to diminish its importance because we all think it's really important too, but that it has effects on your life if you do it yeah um, more people realize that now i mean i occasionally hover on the fringes of academia um, and one of the, the statistics that i heard which completely on the one level completely shocks me and on another level you just shrug your shoulders in despair is that during coronavirus, male academics have been submitting more papers and academic women have been submitting, guess what, less papers. Um, you know, it's like wherever you look, wherever you look, it's just kind of, it's still work, caring work gets shoved back onto women. And... Um, Yes, I don't want to end on a depressing note, but I would like to know how we could deal with this, really, um, as well as all the other millions and millions of things that we have to deal with. Okay, now, um, okay, have are there, is there anybody else um, who has a burning question that they would like to put before we we all move into a more informal space where everyone who's had quite enough of this can go away if they want to. Um, this is your last opportunity. Um, okay, good. So I can only see um, about half of you. So hopefully Magda's monitoring the other screen as well. Uh, oh, no, you're all okay. Grand. Okay, so in that case, as I said, um, we will be, we'll stay logged on until nine. And if you want to hang around, that's really fine. Um, I should just tell you um, that next week, next Thursday, um, we're having uh, the Women's Budget Group is um, doing a presentation um, of the overall um, more uh, an overview of it's they've produced a report called where crises collide uh, COVID-19 and women so um, hopefully they'll um, be touching upon many more of the reasons why we need feminist revolution <laughs> and um, we are we're hoping to organize further um, webinars um, uh covering you know the gamut of the ways in which we as women care both formally and informally um if you would like to um help us to organize any of those um please write to us um and um you can find out more details on our website which um you, it's a place where you can sign up for our monthly e-bulletin um, and you can donate. <laughs> Just a final reminder that we would love to uh, have you uh, not only one-off donations, but if you'd like to give us a small but regular donation, you can join our friends scheme, which is really what keeps us going. Um, okay. Yes, Gail. Women's research plummets. There we are. There's somebody's put the article up there, the Guardian article about women's research plummets during lockdown. Yes. Okay. 
Um, and then somebody else has just put, remember the info on Spain recently, oh, it was Sue, I think, where having paternity leave put men there off having any more children. So the birth rate in that group is down. They said they discovered that looking after kids was hard work. <laughs> Well, as if we didn't know that already. Okay, so um, I just let's have a final round of applause and whatever for Sue and Nadia and everybody else. Uh, it's just wonderful, a uh, brilliant way to kick off our, our series and hope to see you back again soon and etc. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.